times in Virginia discussing a lot of this. Uh, and I, I think I think coronavirus ceasefire is a, is a great uh, jargon and a, and a, and a, and a Peace time zone is another one that I would like to pick on. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Ambassador Ashok uh, Sajanhar and ask, uh, where are we? And I'm going to localize this. Where are we on Kashmir? Is there go something first and foremost, if you don't mind, talk about a little bit what's happening between Pakistan and India, but also, of course, the wider view and maybe your take on what we can do in our own region. Uh, great. So, uh, Arsene, if you permit, uh, I will uh, also try to briefly respond to your first question also. Is uh, the coronavirus pandemic time a good time? And again, if you don't mind, as I mentioned, you know, it's getting a little late here. And uh, <clears throat> Susan was just mentioning about uh, uh, domestic uh, harmony and amity. And, uh, yeah, you know, I think the family would be waiting for dinner at about uh, quarter to nine or nine o'clock. So I don't want to spoil that harmony. If you permit, I will be with you for next half an hour or so. And of course, happy to participate in all the discussions. So first coming to the question, Arsene, that you said whether COVID-19 is a good time. Now, what might be a good time in theory might not really be a good time as far as practice is concerned. What Susan said is very right. Antonio Guterres made a call. He said, uh, let there be no conflict. He also said, let us remove all sanctions because this is the time when sanctions should not be there because people are really fighting. But has this call been heeded? Not at all. You know, first of all, we find in terms of, you know, one had hoped that the so-called US-China trade war with the agreement, the first phase one agreement being signed on the 15th of January, that at least there would be a modicum of normal relations. Unfortunately, with the coming of COVID, what do you see? Meaning there has been in terms of uh, uh, claims and allegations and criticism from both sides it is coming. Even as far as uh, the multilateral organization, WHO, uh, how it has conducted itself, how it has proved to be so subservient to China. And what the United States is claiming, the virus came from China. China did not inform the world. That is why all of us are in the sort of state that we are. What do you see from Australia? Australia says we need to find the origin of virus. What does China say? China says Australia is like used chewing gum on the bottom of our souls. You know, these are not the words that you use at the time of peace. Uh, the European Union, you are very close there, Arsene. The European Union says, yes, we find there is uh, merit in what, uh, uh, what uh, Australia is asking for. So here you see, of course, how things are going to ultimately shape up. It's going to be uh, after we have dealt with the coronavirus. But at the moment, it doesn't look all that good. If you look at some specific uh, cases, as far as South China Sea is concerned, as far as East uh, China Sea is concerned, on 14th of April, China's ships go and they sink one of the trawlers of Vietnam. There is tension there because uh, whatever it might be, there are countries who are using the time of uh, this pandemic for geopolitics, for power play, uh, for politics. So I think this has to be kept in mind while we might say that every day is a good day for peace. I agree with that. I fully support that. But I think one has to be a realist and see what is happening. Now, I mentioned also about the removal of sanctions. But uh, rather than uh, sanctions being removed, particularly from Iran, they, uh, nothing has been done on that. And in that sense, the, the uh, conflict between the United States and uh, uh, Iran, in terms of the war of words, that is getting worse. As far as uh, uh, you mentioned about uh, Kashmir, uh, here also, while Pakistan is having a much uh, bigger problem uh, in dealing with the virus, because why? Because although they say that we will have a lockdown, a sort of a curfew, but as far as offering namaz in the masjid, in the mosque is concerned, there will be no uh, ban on that because uh, the mullahs and the Malavis, they have said that uh, we cannot uh, have a ban on uh, people going to 
the masjid. So where is the social distancing there? So while you see in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, that as far as the Kaaba is concerned, as far as Makkah, Medina are concerned, they are absolutely desolate, nothing happening there. But in Pakistan, you have uh, in the holy month of Ramadan, there are people who are going to mosques. In uh, uh, Pakistan, there has been a new body that has been created, the resistance front. That under its charge gets all the, uh, all the terrorist elements of jaish e muhammad of Hezbollah Mujahideen. And over the last few days, particularly in April, in the second half of April, the uh, ceasefire violations and the infiltration of terrorists from uh, Pakistan to India, that has increased significantly. So while uh, India has been with its 1.3 billion population, we started on our lockdown with uh, on the 25th of March. Uh, tomorrow, the second phase of the lockdown will uh, uh, end, but that will lead into the third phase, which will go on up to 17th of May. Meaning if there's interest, I'll be happy to say a few words there. But I would say that so far, India has been reasonably successful very successful in terms of implementing the lockdown, but in terms of total number of positive infections, about 37,000 of them, and in terms of deaths, about 1,200 or so. So we have, and in terms of the, uh, in terms of recovery, uh, it has been more than 10,000. So our record on uh, infections, on recoveries, and on uh, casualties, has been much better than the average of uh, in, uh, uh, you know, if you take about 100 countries in the world on the top, what is their average, India's average is uh, considerably better. Of course, uh, we are nowhere near what the numbers that you have in Europe or in the United States, but still we have a huge population and a huge challenge, but uh, the country is trying to do it uh, in a very united manner. And so far we've had complete unity as far as uh, lockdown, uh, lockdowns are concerned, as far as uh, ensuring uh, that there is physical isolation and spacing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for, for your great comments. Uh, I just want to uh, add that it's not only Islam uh, that can contribute to further uh, or, 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 or uh, further spread of the of the of COVID-19 in, in this particular case for the social distancing. We've had challenges of our own, both in Georgia and Armenia. It was Easter time and there was a, almost a big battle between the state and the church because the church wanted to do it basically the way it does every year. So uh, I would say that the challenges uh, for, for a social anthropologist, this is an enormously interesting time to do research on how different institutions and people behave at a time of crisis of this scale. I'm going to- uh, Arsene, just one comment, one comment, because you know, uh, uh, please don't misunderstand me. I didn't mean to uh, separate out uh, uh, Islam as such, but since we were, you asked me about uh, Kashmir and India, Pakistan, I referred, but I also referred that uh, in the holiest of places of Islam, Makkah, Medina, and Kaaba, they are absolutely empty. So I think it really depends upon the uh, uh, countries, the leadership, the governance really, as to how it wants to take this thing forward. Thank you. Uh, taken, uh, well, well, point well taken, Ambassador. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, because I'm talking from the region, I'm going to ask dear Tina Ting to wait for another mm -hmm. second so we go to Eve maybe first and see what, what we have in Europe and then we end in Georgia and Armenia at this stage, if you don't mind. No. Okay. You, you asked me? No, I'm asking Eve to, to, to be ah, next. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Well, to the question, uh, is a uh, time good for peace? Well, I agree with Susan that uh, it's always time. I agree that the Secretary General has asked for peace. I agree also with uh, Ashok that uh, unfortunately, uh, 
many countries have used this opportunity to strengthen authoritarian uh, governments, have used this uh, situ the situation of the pandemic for uh, increasing rep uh, repression and so on. But uh, I am also interested by what has been said during the debate today. Clearly, it was said for me that uh, for the question of the situation in the Caucasus, that uh, deliberately or not, the uh, world, the, the main power and the main uh, economic uh, unions are disrupting the links between the countries of the region for two, by two, in two ways. Some are not clearly trying to make peace in the region. Russia has not given clear sign that it wants to peace in the area. Second, that uh, all of the powers are selling arms and selling arms in particular in the region and throughout the world. Uh, third, the global economy as it works is dismantling also links because uh, the global economy is producing goods and services which usually were exchanged in the, between the countries of the region and economies which are weak uh, are weakened by the uh, international competition as it works. It, it is difficult to develop uh, strong elements. So I would say that the maybe we should have more peace. And I come now to the pandemia. What the pandemia uh, brought, in my view, is first of all, People of the world know that they are in a one world and that things are global, not only in economy, but things also in, in health. And certainly that the possibility of global war <laughs> is not impossible. So uh, what is uh, encouraging is that in all countries, you have seen a sign of solidarity and including in India in the fight against pandemia, I think uh, uh, Ekta Parishad is doing a great job in uh, helping the people who have been uh, obliged to go back home uh, to be fed. Uh, the, uh, in, my, uh, in, in Europe, you can see a lot of initiative to help people uh, to to, uh, to support the uh, uh, the confinement, I don't know if the word is a, a global word. Uh, the, uh, and, uh, and mainly they are given a lot of thought to what could be another world. And certainly in all the debates, the, the hundreds of papers you receive on mail every day about the, the situation, there are papers about the economy, there are papers about uh, war, there are papers about uh, solidarity, but there is a movement, which is for me the most important, is that people want to say what to do. They want to have a say in the decision of the future. And I hope that at least this dimension will survive after the end of the pandemic. Thank you. Merci, merci, monsieur. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 with this, um, I think, a uh, very, very good outlook on, on how the different economies will, will shape up uh, before uh, we, we move on. I, I will I'll get to my next question. But now I would like to ask Calvaton Otinatin to maybe <laughs> talk a little bit about uh, what's oh, happening. Nice. What, what has been happening in Georgia 
uh, did you have, for example, I was following quite closely uh, also the, the line of contact, Abkhazia, Ossetia, has there been, what has been going on on that front? Uh, just before you go on, I will give an example of how uh, it actually unfortunately did not impact positively in case of Karabakh. Uh, we had just uh, two drones that were shut down last week. So uh, in a way, uh, unfortunately, the escalation has been going on. What is the situation in your case? Um, first, I want to answer first question shortly. Sure, sure. Um, because uh, it was very important for me because uh, something unexpected happened was happening and happened and uh, it was like uh, for me it was like uh, 2008 when uh, georgia was bombed um, from russian side and uh, we were totally lost we could not imagine that Russia will bomb territory of Georgia. And uh, those days, <laughs> that, that, that period was, um, it was the period when I knew <clears throat> from ICCN and uh, was uh, in the, uh, attended or, or worked, um, worked uh, another, uh, um, how to say, a place, worked at the, another, another place. And I, I, I returned to, to conflict and to, um, to think, uh, start, started to think about what, what is happening and how we could survive. And uh, I, some, something uh, something interesting I I think um, uh, came to my mind that in in California at uh, people are um, uh, as I know maybe I'm wrong uh, people people are waiting waves huge waves to skip on the wave and to um, uh, to 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 catch the those waves and uh, um, oh, okay uh, and um, I think that uh, such kind of uh, uh, such kind of uh, things uh, are like waves in California Beach and on the when people are wake, waiting rocks at the high rock and uh, skipped on the wave. And uh, I, this time I also, uh, once again, I remember about uh, California and waves <laughs> and uh, huge waves because that time it, um, uh, after the um, uh, 2008, uh, there were a lot of difficulties, but we had a lot of, uh, uh, success in terms of public dip diplomacy, um, interrelations and understanding each other, trying and uh, understanding each other and understanding each other. Uh, um, Abkhaz and uh, Georgian young people, uh, young people, professionals, we were me 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 meeting, we had a lot of meetings and uh, a lot of um, not not simply meetings, but we worked hard um, for uh, for uh, catching uh, for gaining uh, uh, results, real results, and uh, move forward forward. And uh, um, so now this this time, uh, I once again. Um, remember about that uh, stress, big stress, and uh, pe people in Georgia are under the um, huge stress because, uh, because uh, pol of uh, poverty, because they have no um, jobs, 
there, there, there are no, no, no jobs, no, no money, no nothing. And uh, the situation is much worse uh, than in uh, 2008, much more worse. And um, that's why uh, it, is, uh, it is very important to um, understand the situation first. I, I'd, li I'd like to have a picture, the, maybe not, not whole, but picture of the, some kind of picture of uh, um, real, uh, real uh, conditions and real situation uh, for starting to think about um, where to, Step move forward. Move, move forward. forward. Yes. Yeah. Make make steps because it is very def difficult, difficult, ex extremely difficult when people are under the huge stress. It is not only words. It is the situation we have here, and if we couldn't manage with uh, uh, their emotions, their um, uh, huge. Uh, um, uh, situations, uh, conditions, um, we couldn't survive, even survive. Mm. Thank you, Tina. Thank you for touching upon and personalizing the issue that I think everybody in, in all cultures we're facing with, and that is uh, <clears throat> this lockdown uh, is sometimes the claustrophobic situation that we find ourselves in is definitely an additional stress to the already existing <coughs> general environment. Um, I know that Ambassador Sajan uh, um, uh, is, is in a hurry, but I'm going to co go on with another question and maybe to pick with you and then move on with a different, um, the different uh, uh, way, the, 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 the sequence. So <clears throat> my question is, um, We've been uh, in conflict resolution. We understand. We have a very clear understanding. And Susan here uh, is 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 uh, has a great background on what zone of peace means. It's a very particular thing. On the one hand, um, things that actually uh, were suggested and, and worked in some Latin American countries. Um, in case of Philippines, we have a successful story with a zone of peace. Uh, but we have been imagining, and back in 2009, we were doing a symposium at the George Mason University together with Irakli Kakabadze, uh, uh, Chris Mitchell, and we had, we still had Dennis Sandoli uh, back in the day, um, who have been talking, and we were discussing a possibility for a zone of peace here in Caucasus, and how we can maybe bring this together. Now, from the Caucasus angle, but also through the world, we all understand and realize that this coronavirus, um, whatever comes next, however quickly the economies open, we will have a global economic downfall. We are having it already. Um, estimates are different uh, on macroeconomic level, on the, on the local level. Smaller countries like <clears throat> ours will have their problems, large economies like that of the India, European Union, the US will have their own. Uh, is there something that peace builders both on the, uh, on the civil society level or sci science or, 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 or activism to governments or people who, uh, international organizations for that matter, religious institutions to now on start working on some form or shape of, of, of a peace zone or, or, or a free economic zone for that matter. I don't, I mean, zones or oasis of where people can continue trading because um, Tina Tin touched upon the very important aspect of the personal level um, stress. Uh, this stress is going to turn into some, uh, most probably, hopefully not, but most probably going to turn into some kind of a, a collective anger at some a juncture if uh, some of the negative predictions come around. So the question is, post-coronavirus or whatever coronavirus <laughs> economic downfall, what should be done? What can we do from UN? Do you have UN experience uh, uh, to, I don't know, international organizations, uh, state players, uh, and different societal entities to kind of prevent or create zones 
which can uh, in, the, in the future work to the benefit of preventing further escalations and conflict. So is this uh, to me, uh, Arsene? Yes, yes, and to everyone else, maybe <clears throat> to open up a discussion. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. And uh, you know, you raised a very, very important uh, issue. And uh, let me try to respond to it on, in two or three bullet points. The first bullet point here is that, uh, you know, whenever a crisis has taken place, let us say, after the Second World War, whenever a crisis in the world has taken place, it is always America that has assumed the leadership role, always. You know, whether it was the 2008 economic crisis, whether it was before that, the global war on terror, whether it was uh, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the leadership of the United States has always been evident till now. Now the United States has withdrawn. You know, the whole uh, policy, meaning I, I, uh, this is not a forum to, you know, pass value judgments or be critical, but I think we have to see the situation as it exists, that uh, America has withdrawn. And uh, the America first policy, again, maybe for domestic reasons or domestic politics, it was required, it was necessary, but uh, this is the something that has been continuing. And as far as right now is uh, uh, the situation is, that the sort of vacuum that is being created is uh, there is uh, uh, an attempt by China to move into that vacuum. Now, how much it will be welcomed, how much it will have a possibility, but because as I said at the beginning, whether it is Australia, whether it is Europe, whether it is the United States, there is a seething rage and anger against China because it did not come out openly uh, when the virus originally started. And also China is now playing the victim. It is rather than being the villain, it's trying to pose as a hero. There might be countries who are not saying it openly because they can't say it openly. But I think there is this uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, huge uh, uh, fault lines and fractures and fissures in the world that are happening. The second aspect there is that uh, multilateralism, at least in the current context, we could see that it was not fulfilling the task that it was required to do. But in the current context, it has failed completely. For instance, if you look at the meeting of the G7, they couldn't even come up with a resolution, a common consensus resolution, you know, saying that this is a big pandemic, all of us need to get together. You look at the meeting of the UN Security Council, the UN Security Council could not meet in March because China was chairing the UN Security Council during that month and China maintained with the help of Russia, that it is uh, not an issue that impacts on uh, uh, international global security and peace. So no meeting could be held. The next from 1st of May, we had uh, Est Estonia, or it was Dominican Republic, one of these two. They became the chair and then the meeting was held on the 9th of May, but still no, uh, sorry, 9th of April. I'm mixing the months a little bit. In March, it could not take place, but on the 9th of April, it took place, but again, without any result. The G20 meeting, that would not meet. It was only when uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, exhorted and uh, uh, nudged the, uh, the uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia as the chair, then the meeting took place on the 26th, but still no result. The point I'm making is, that uh, United States has not taken the leadership, the multilateral organizations have not taken the leadership. So what really needs to be done is number one, that powers, the other powers, whether it is Europe, whether it is India, whether it is Japan, whether it is uh, Brazil, South Africa, uh, other countries, I think they as countries need to get together. More importantly, I think it is the civil societies in all these uh, uh, around the world. And I think Jai Jagat is a very, very important element in that. Who need to get together and they need to mobilize an opinion that the world has to get together to deal with this. You know, if you leave it to either the United States or to China, we are not going to really be able to see things, uh, any, any particular progress. And here, when the societies get together 
and then you get the people to people and uh, you know i don't have that much of uh, uh, knowledge or information about uh, the conflicts in uh, karabakh and uh, uh, ossetia and abkhazia although i have uh, studied them i remember when i was in ambassador to kazakhstan at that time <clears throat> kazakhstan assumed the chair of osce the organization of security and uh, cooperation in europe and its um, main purpose was its main priority objective was these uh, uh, countries these conflicts are known as the frozen conflicts i don't know we are talking about uh, peace zones but otherwise in other language they are called frozen conflicts and their top priority of kazakhstan at that time was how do we solve these frozen conflicts so at the government levels many attempts have been made many trials have been made but it has not been successful so i think the initiative now really needs to come from the people from the society and my last word that i will say here is because in india we are still trying to uh, to because in my earlier uh, uh, responsibility as head of the national foundation of communal harmony what i found and i continue to pursue that in india and maybe you could look at it in terms of uh, the social media because social media is extremely powerful tool and instrument to bring people together and this is what we are trying to do here today so i think if you are looking at abkhazia ossetia if you are looking at karabakh amongst the people how do you get them together number one is through the power of social media number two maybe also through the power of uh, trade of market of economy when they see that there is interdependence when they see that there is a, a greater uh, uh, exchange economic exchange and benefit in uh, people coming together then i think there will be a move from both sides to ensure that it transforms into an island of peace a zone of peace and not of conflict thank you thank you ambassador thank you i uh, uh, your video went off uh, just about 3 minutes ago if you want oh, i don't know okay. that that would be great we still heard it all and thank you i think i did at least i hope the rest of the panelists did too um before i move on to susan i want to ask eve to maybe touch upon with the experience of the un and the larger international organizations um where so the same basically the same question uh, the, the 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 upcoming economic crisis you've touched upon this um where are where are the international organizations where should they be at this besides the um contingency and the damage control that needs to be done no matter what what can be contributed what can be um uh, i want to say uh, invested what are those directions that you think that should be invested in order to prevent further escalations and bloodshed Arsen could I take leave of uh, the uh, this eminent uh, panel and express my gratitude appreciation and uh, also pleasure at having had the possibility and of course I'll look at the rest of the conversation as Jill said it will be on YouTube so I look forward to doing that and uh, let me say what a great pleasure it has been thank you and congratulations and all success to all of you thank you thank you sure sure thank you, thank you for thank you. joining Thank you. Thank you. If this is tech support, you need to unmute your mic. If you need to unmute your mic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I, uh, I was trying to open the little red. microphone not the white one <laughs> so sorry the um, well, for, it's clear there are different forces at playing for the time being it's it's very clear that for instance in europe we felt uh, and in, in the united states we were surprised to be so dependent of china and uh, because of that there are very strong forces in order to relocate part of the uh, industrial activities uh, at least to to be less dependent so that is a forces which is not against uh, regional 
area of, of for trade and so on. But it is it is clear that there will be some some forces in this direction. Of course, the extremist right takes this opportunity to say, oh, we should even close the frontiers between the countries of, of the Union and stop these exchanges within the Union. But I, it will not go very far. Now, you were asking the question of the, of the uh, UN. Well, I, I, I will make a plea for my institution because I've, I've been the head of the Economic Commission for Europe for a while. And uh, all the Caucasus is part of the Economic Commission for Europe. What, what did this Economic Commission just after the war when the, uh, it was clear there was, was no possible political agreement and agreement on the view of how the economy should develop between the East and the West. But what was done is to, to work on what can we do, where can we go in order to for the advantage of both sides. So uh, I think we should keep this element. It, it's not put in the same direction, but you have a, a body where you can look at only economic matters from a point of view uh, with a, a body which is used to say, what can we do together, even if we have not the same views on political views and so on. Uh, you have areas of which are important. You have uh, transport, you have energy, you have uh, uh, tra uh, trade and so on. But let's say on energy, it's an issue of interest in the Caucasus, uh, which is uh, very touchy. And uh, I remember, at least when I was in the, in the commission, that we, we, that was the discussion on the supply of gas for Western Europe, what routes should be used, and uh, how to balance the interest. If you, it, it worked particularly on gas. On transport, just after the breakdown of the USSR, there were roads coming from, let's say, Madrid to Moscow, or, or to, to Spain to uh, USSR. For USSR, there were only three roads. One uh, going to Kiev, another to um, Moscow, of course, and uh, the third one to, ah, oh, I don't remember <laughs> the name now, but it, it, I know where it is and I went there several times, but nevertheless, I have not the name in mind, it's my age. Uh, the, uh, these three roads, when the uh, USSR broke down, it took five years to get roads going to each of the countries of the former USSR, because US, uh, Russia wanted that the roads go through Russia and not, for instance, uh, through uh, Turkey or through uh, 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 nevertheless. Sorry. Iran, Iran probably. No, it was not Iran, it was uh, Do. Oh. No, not Crimea, but the. Uh, oh yeah. Sorry, I, I, I know the place. The uh, Baltics, maybe, the Baltics. No, 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 no. no. The, the country which, to which uh, Crimea used to belong. Ukraine. Voilà. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know why I cannot find the word. Uh, so it, um, it, it, there were different roads possible. So it took five years. 
but it's a place where you solve problems. Another example on environment, which was mentioned several times during the discussion, but not addressed directly. Uh, to fight for your environment, there are a lot of policy, but including pollution is one of them. And in this commission, we had debate about uh, uh, air pollution. And we had a lot of convention agreed throughout uh, the region. The last uh, agreement we, I remember signing was on multipolluant. And we were helped by uh, researcher, uh, scientist to fine tune this agreement. And the day where we, uh, they were, the countries were signing the agreement, they said to us, in less than 10 years from now, all what we are signing today will be, uh, will be not efficient because of the pollution coming from China and uh, or through the pole from uh, North America. So it, it's interesting because it's a place where you can discuss things relatively freely. Uh, so I, I, uh, as you ask, a place in the UN. Of course, it's not as easy to discuss in the uh, the mm. C, uh, community of uh, independent states, but you are, uh, but very now the European Union. I, I would like to, to say something about a problem in the uh, in former Yugoslavia. When the former Yugoslavia broke. It was not easy to reestablish relationship between the different countries, uh, the different parts of Yugoslavia, which have become independent states. But I remember that he was, it was asked to the Economic Commission for Europe to facilitate the discussion among the states, of uh, the new states, discussing again of transport on. Uh, a lot of rules which are practical in the day-to-day -day life and which are important and where country were not happy to discuss that together directly or bilaterally, but they were more at ease to discuss it in a multilateral framework. So that are, uh, that are examples. Uh, and you know, for instance, to give an exam another example, which is more political because it's uh, linked to the problem within a country. But when uh, it was the end of the colonial era in Argentina, it was the Economic Commission for Latin America which offer a place from the two leading parties in, Arme in uh, Argentina one of them will take power because after the election, the election, they were preparing, the, the country was preparing the elections and the two parties accepted to discuss what we have to do in any case, being the, the Peronist or being the, uh, the others. What have we to do? We are ready to discuss that in escape. We are not ready to discuss that together in Argentina. So you have to use this international body to initiate discussion and uh, in a, a region also close from your region, in uh, Central Asia, in the countries of Central Asia, again, after the, uh, the break of the US, Relationships were not that easy with a lot of uh, grievance from one country to the other about water management, for instance. The, uh, again, the Economic Commission for Europe and the Economic Commission for Asia, for uh, Asia and Pacific, they agreed 
to work together in order to facilitate discussion among uh, states. So that, sorry, I, I, I was too long, but it gives you an example of how you can use the international organization of the UN. Thank you, thank you, Eve, for 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 the great examples and 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 contextualizing it in already existing experience of how international organizations were utilized and cooperated in order to address global issues. Susan, please come in and please tell us what the scholars and what the practitioners can do at a situation of this and the post coronavirus mm -hmm. economic crisis that we're all waiting for. Yeah, I think um, your question about the post coronavirus economic crisis and what can we do now to be prepared for that world. Um, and I appreciate you're also bringing in a role for scholars. Um, I think that while we're all stuck at home in our various confinement uh, and, and stay at home orders and quarantines and so forth, I think that this is a time that we can do some um, planning for imagine two years from now, economies are, are, we're able to meet with each other face to face uh, more freely and we're trying to rebuild economies. Um, I wanna bring up an idea specifically uh, given that this conference is being hosted uh, with you Arsene uh, from Armenia um, as a host of this, con uh, of this panel. Um, one of the ideas I want to suggest for consideration, and again, of course, this would not work today. Today, we need to stay six feet away from each other and we need to wear masks and, and so forth. And this is not the right time. But can you imagine two years from now establishing, you know, as, as everyone's economy is hurting, for both Armenia and Turkey, there would be benefit to having a commercial zone along the border between Armenia and Turkey. And can you imagine, a, I don't know how big it is, you know, is it a, a mile by mile or it's some confined zone that becomes a, a free economic zone. And there could be manufacturing of different sorts happening in there, uh, labor from, from both sides of the, of, you know, from, from Armenia and from Turkey, uh, markets would open up with that kind of a free economic zone. Um, and that could help both Armenia and Turkey's economy uh, because of the creative shift of what's possible when it's a free economic zone uh, and reducing, you know, uh, especially when right now we have no contact across the Armenia-Turkey border to create something that radical uh, would require many years of planning and thinking and discussions. And planning and thinking and discussions is what we can do right now by internet and by Zoom and by these phone calls. And no one would expect that anything would happen radically in interest, uh, in instantly, because of course we can't create a commercial zone when we can't even have any commercial activity. Um, but so I wanna suggest that as something that would be worth consideration um, by Armenia and Turkey. And while there's not diplomatic uh, recognition and diplomatic contacts, um, there could be others that could serve a role for hosting those conversations. Um, and whether it's the neighbor Georgia represented on our panel or something, you know, a country more removed like India represented here or, or whether it's the UN had, would have some, uh, I'm intrigued by the economic uh, commission uh, and would, would that economic commission have any role to uh, facilitate creative discussions such as that? Um, uh, or is it a non an, an NGO? that could host some creative thinking or scholars who could host some creative thinking on that. So that's an idea I wanted to put out in terms of the question of what can we do now to start thinking about a year or two from now, the post pandemic global downturn. Um, and that's just one of many things, I guess I wanna make the general point that we need to use this time to be ready for re-engaging. And we will be re-engaging in a world that is different. And it will be a world where everyone has economic interests in rebuilding and everyone's economy will have suffered. Um, maybe not Zoom, there are a few, a few companies that are doing well, but most companies are, are really struggling um, and most countries are really struggling. I wanna also, so the question that uh, Eve Rose raised about transportation and roads 
that's another area we have, you know, any transportation in or out of Armenia goes through Georgia. And is there any way to change that <laughs> given the extreme uh, economic downturn and we will all be suffering, um, you know, saving on how many hours truck drivers need to be driving their trucks and how far those trucks need to go would be, would be a step uh, towards a, uh, rebuilding economies. Um, the other uh, question, Sajjan Har mentioned the, the lack of US leadership now. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that and acknowledge that those of us who live in the US, we have some responsibility to um, change what's happening in US politics. <laughs> yeah, we have some responsibility to be uh, responsible members of the world community by taking care of our own problems at home um, and recognizing that we need to think beyond uh, slogans and America first uh, um, things. And that, that I think that that's a, an argument that many of us will be making in the lead up to November here when we have an election. So. Um, I wouldn't want us to return to a, a sense of that the U.S. must lead because certainly there are many other countries ready to lead with great ideas. Um, but I also don't want to be in a world where the U.S. is totally withdrawn and doesn't help out. Uh, the U.S. needs to be a member of the world community. So I wanted to acknowledge um, Ambassador Sajjan Har's uh, comments. And I hope when he uh, can listen to the the audio recording um, of this session that he will uh, recognize that, that I heard him being based here in the US, I heard him loud and clear and I agree with him that this is something we really need to address. So, okay, I'll stop there. <clears throat> Thank you, Susan. Thank you, some very, very important points. Um, yeah, I think we are going through a very unique time in sense of, I mean, if you, if you map out the administrations in different places, um, at this time and how, how different, uh, different groups react. Uh, EU, big players, uh, same China, Ambassador touched upon, and of course, the US, uh, India, and, 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 and else. Uh, 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 the point on Armenia, Turkey, and then the possibility for talk is, is of course great. I'm not very optimistic, unfortunately, on this, uh, but uh, agreed on, on trying to think and discuss and consider possible options on, of course, seeding maybe some uh, options for uh, for com commerce and on the border. Uh, I think there was a very, very interesting point uh, uh, at some point from Turkey, we heard that they went to the Armenian church there and said that Turkey is ready to uh, support Armenia somehow. Uh, and of course, the Armenian government here didn't pick it up, pick up pick, they didn't get any official offer, but the uh, response was, well, uh, no, uh, uh, a help would be uh, opening the border. Uh, so so th this one this one thing, I mean, Armenia is open for opening the border and starting it, and it has been consistently, and it continues to say that it's ready for relations with no preconditions. This is a stand, stand that Yerevan continues to say. So the problem, or I would say the ball is in the field of Turkey in that sense, but it doesn't mean that on the societal level, on, on other levels, we shouldn't work on building up better options for this. And I think that's a great suggestion to consider. And, and, and bearing this, I'm going to Tina Tin maybe. Do you see a possibility for a discussion uh, between Georgia and Russia and, and maybe finding a breakthrough when it comes to the, the conflicts, but, but also uh, seeding something positive for the upcoming uh, situation? And I will be very honest and frank here. I, as somebody uh, from Armenia, we depend on the trade zone and the tr trade path uh, and Russia-Georgia relations are of uh, uh, highest importance for us. So the better those relations, it's the better for us, uh, but for, for, for generally for the region as well. Uh, but also um, do you being from Georgia and of course remembering the 2008 escalation, remembering a lot of the stress that you've been going through, is there any chance for the for a progress there, especially considering the fact that there is the the the, the general economic downfall coming? And I think countries, no matter what, have to cooperate and unite at least on some issues. 
very, very long question. And uh, no, I'm not a politician. I'm such a social psychologist. Um, and, uh, but it, it is interesting for me, it is also very inter interesting question. And I was, think, I was thinking also about uh, free zones and why um, Armenia, Azerbaijan and uh, Georgia could not uh, inter, uh, inter uh, how to say, um, develop um, more relationships and uh, uh, more uh, um, looking for and uh, searching for uh, common interests because uh, we we are different we are all different <laughs> but we are different within the uh, Caucasus uh, um, South Caucasus uh, um, place and uh, it is it, it is very interesting and it, it is uh, challenging and it is uh, I like it that that we are different uh, and uh, I think uh, it 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 could be that the new step the further step will be uh, will be done <laughs> created for. Uh, some some kind of uh, um, I, I, networking among the uh, among the those countries cultural cultural things uh, historical things a lot a lot of questions and uh, a lot of interesting points but then Russia quickly skip <laughs> come. <laughs> To my mind, because I, I have a lot of, a lot of very close re relatives, Russia, Russian from Russia in Russia, in Moscow, uh, my my brother and his big family, and uh, uh, from my early childhood, I communicated more with Russians, on Russian language speak speak on the russian language uh, and um, that's why i love them <laughs> because they they are part of me but that that's that's why i'm very angry i'm very angry because we had a lot of um, similar um, understanding uh, and uh, uh, for example, literature, for example, science, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, I have some such kind of uh, um, how to say uh, two two side uh, some, some some kind of uh, extreme extreme uh, feelings and extreme. Um, uh, view how, how how I see how I um, how I uh, feel about their policy and the politics and politicians and etc uh, etc et I, I I'm very critical very critical very angry and um, that's why and and uh, and uh, they are very polite with us they they love us. Uh, Georgian people and the society, etc., etc. Uh, but leave it alone now. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, four or five years ago, um, Ilhan Galtung was in in our office, uh, uh, ICCN. Maybe more <laughs> time. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, and uh, I asked him, I, 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 I'm very fond of him, him because he is a very creative person, very interesting person. And uh, every time when we had some kind of uh, meetings and uh, interrelations, uh, it was very interesting. And I was sitting by his side 
and I asked him about Russia. What could we do with Russia in relationships and, 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 and in total? And um, he said that, uh, it, he told me that the key to the problem, I, I, I suppose you know it, uh, he's uh, saying, uh, the key to, for, to the problem uh, is the, in the, in the, is uh, uh, you have to see, seek, seek, uh, when we want to find something. <laughs> uh, key where you will, do not want, do not want to go. And you say, no way, I will go, I never, never. And uh, on, asked me to try. And uh, then I um, somehow uh, rethink everything. And I, I think that, I think that it is true. I think that if, if I do not know, is our problem Russia? Maybe not. Maybe our problem is in, inside, uh, in, 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 in our society, first of all. I do, do not know. I do not want and I do not like to um, um, speak and uh, talk and uh, say something, anything without, without uh, thinking, without deep understanding, without deep analysis. analysis. But at the same time, if you want to be creative, it, and it is the second, uh, uh, second, uh, I, I think, uh, second way, uh, one more way. Uh, if you want, uh, if you want uh, to find something, anything, any innovation in your life and in, in society, you have to be creative. So uh, cre creativity, I think creativity is one of the keys and uh, uh, not be to not, not to be uh, not to be um, uh, I don't know that word um, uh, stuck or when 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 a person when person um, could not change uh, his uh, point of view or uh, stuck or yeah so two things I I suppose uh, not only two but thank it's enough. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tinatin. Thank you so much. Thank you for. Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Many, many times, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, no, I'm, no. I'm really tired today. No, uh, it was no, no, very no, interesting. Very no, interesting. Your, 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 your background of, of also, of course, the relations with Russia and 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 your own personal story, but also your understanding and 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 maybe rethinking or reflecting on how um, we should uh, first and foremost uh, not just look at the issue of the existing conflict from the angle that we're at or from the already existing jargon or realities, but also look inside of ourselves and see what our problems are. I will just give one example of how just about a week ago, I have made one uh, line on Facebook, which became a major source for attack which was um, on the commemoration of the Armenian genocide. I have put out just one sentence, which was, we remember, we are ready to forgive, but we will never forget that we are ready to forgive has become, has made me a target so bad that I was, I was getting personal threats. So looking at ourselves and understanding what uh, some of the stereotypes that drive us is, is maybe something that we constantly do, uh, should do. And at the time of uh, COVID-19, where people are more, much more stressed out, I guess it's not a good idea to spark a discussion like that. But I don't know. It is what it is. I want to uh, thank everyone for finding time and joining us today with this wonderful panel. Once again, 
thank you for, for, for following this process. I want to uh, extend my special thanks to the uh, both technical and the content team, uh, both from India and from Armenia, uh, for, for, and, and for more all, all over the world, also uh, suggesting and discussing the, uh, the, 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 the conference and, and the whole day. Uh, this was a huge uh, work and I, am, I was again, I want to thank the, the great panelists that, that joined us uh, from Ambassador Sajangar to uh, Tina Tin to uh, Mr. Berthold, Bechtelo, Bechtelo, uh, I don't know what is the right way. Uh, and of course, my great colleague and friend, Susan Nan, Susan Allen. Uh, so uh, so oh. uh, stay, please stay safe, uh, stay, um, stay home and try uh, try to uh, avoid any any possible uh, appearance and or uh, connection to COVID. So uh, I, by Thank this, I want to wish you the, the best uh, rest of your evening or the day for, for those who are in a different time zone. And I have so many things that I've learned from today that I'm going to go through <laughs> that I, I, I can't thank you uh, enough. So uh, um, again, thank, thank you very you. much, Susan. It's wow. our third meeting <laughs> with you <laughs> yes it's great to see you in this context yeah and yeah. great to, yeah. to, to meet thank to you, meet Arsene. you and good to thank see you, you Arsene. Mr. So, thank you merci monsieur yves thank it was you. great thank you so much yes, thank, thank you, you for uh, your guiding of this of this uh, last meeting it was <laughs> perfect yes we we should have we could have discussed a little bit more. It would have been fascinating, but thank you. I am apologizing. And the reason I am trying to wrap up and we still had the time to go on is that I'm hearing from the organizers and Ashok uh, is gone. Uh, I'm hearing from the organizers that they're going to wrap up with some, also they have a short film that was uh, before we came in. And I think our colleagues will be coming in, but I apologize if you have something in particular in mind uh, if please do 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 say before we go, so that uh, I'm I'm sure there's so much more that we could have discussed. No, 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 no. No, I look at Jill and I say nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just I before you all go, Arsen, thank you for chairing this meeting, and uh, Eve, Tina, Tin, Susan, it's been a pleasure to listen to you and to get your comments. I just want to uh, also say that, you know, we, we started with the notion of peace zones at the, in the morning, but as we've deconstructed peace zones and reconstructed its meaning in so many different contexts, I think we, we now realize that there's uh, a diversity of, of uh, ways of carrying out peace building and uh, uh, what is important is to share those best practices and see where there's relevance uh, and resonance. And uh, I, I think that uh, the 19 speakers that were on today all did that job. And so I thank the speakers, I thank the viewers, and I thank the technical team, and of course, uh, Arsene, Irakli, and David for uh, holding it all together. It's been a real pleasure. And don't forget, this has come after 12 lectures, uh, talks over the course of the month, which you can all see on YouTube. Um, so it's been a pleasure. And even though our Jai Jagat is not marching currently in Georgia, where it was planning to be, we still get the benefit of meeting all of you. So thank you very much and Jai Jagat. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank for a thank you for everything. Yeah, thank you. Jill, you <laughs>